around this town in the show for her charcoal drawing, um, which is called Terry. I think it's just around the corner there. Um, and many of tonight's writers have written about pieces, and you're welcome to ask them, and they will take you over it. That is interesting. Um, I would like to invite you to a first Wednesday series meeting tomorrow night at the Soap Gallery featuring two Pittsburgh writers. And we will also be celebrating National Strawberry Sunday Day. So please stop by the Lit Youngstown um, section of the table at the end to sign up for our monthly newsletter if you're interested or to pick up a flyer about our Fall Literary Festival in October. One of the highlights of the Fall Literary Festival this year will be a gallery talk at the McDonough Museum by Pittsburgh textile artist, Diane Samuels, who is also the co-founder of City of Asylum, a residency program in Pittsburgh for international persecuted writers. And another thing we're doing this year is inviting artists in the community to create visual work that responds to poems and stories by this year's presenters. We have over 70, almost 80 presenters coming in from throughout the United States. And if you're interested in receiving those poems and stories to see if you might be inspired to make some art, um, we have a different sign up for you and I'll send you that information as well. We have five amazing readers tonight. I'm so excited about this reading and I will introduce each reader in alphabetical order. Now eight years old, Lena Carson has been constructing and reading poetry since the age of five. She is the author of Brave Girl, a collection of poems written during the pandemic. She has some copies that are for sale with her tonight. In addition to literature, Lena enjoys nature walks, waving to strangers, <laughs> and saving feeder insects from pet stores. Welcome, Lena Carson. Well, the first one is simple and it's a picture of a cat. <laughs> okay. I will call to be who I am. I may seem, seem simple, I may seem easy. All right. I may seem average, but I am not. I try to use live a unique life every day and as the moon comes i stare at it and i wonder why is it so special so that's the first poem and thank you so the next one is hoping and it's a picture of a room with light Shining down from the roof. What have I done? Why did this happen? What will come next? I know this is not my home, but I am hoping, hoping for a better life, hoping for a new world, hoping for a new friend. Hope comes in through the sunlight, through the moonlight, and through the dim light of the stars. The next one is Mainstorm, and if this seems familiar, it, I've already wrote this. I just found a picture that looks familiar, and I thought I could read this then. So, Mainstorm, there's no dog. My parents tell me that he will be all right, but when I look at him, lying in the snow, wagging his tail, my tears fall like Rainstorm. I ask, will he be all right? Again, my parents say he will be all right, but I just want him to live. He always has been a part of my home. I want him to live with. 
I want to live with him forever. I say it's hard to go, to let him go. And the rainstorm comes again. I feel the rain on my cheek. My parents say he will be all right one more time. And I think his life is like a strawberry shortcake. You start eating with big, excited bites. Very tasty and sweet food. But when it's almost gone, the bites become tiny. So the next one is Will, and it's a watercolor sunset. It's right there, if you're wondering. The day is done. It is time for bed. I gaze out the window. I see, I see the sunset. I wish I could be closer. I would see new things others have missed. I wish I had the power to raise, to rise and set the sun, but I think I do have the power. I can raise and set my happiness like the sun. And when I tuck myself in, I dream of being the sun. I am the warmth of the world. I am the source of nature. I bring color to the darkness. And I rise and set beyond the horizon. The next one is wild and it's a picture of a gray leopard and it might be way in the back, might be. So when I close my eyes, I see everyone as an animal. My father is a wolf, why? He is brave and strong and confident. My brother is a beaver, why? He is different. And a little bit funny. My mom is a leopard. Why? She is caring and powerful. We are all wild inside. Everyone has an inner animal. I am a cat. Why? I do not know. <laughs> so the next one is River, and it's a picture of River with rocks and it looked familiar to a place I saw when I was walking in the woods. I think it might be the same place. Looks very familiar. River, picture of river with rocks. I am walking through the woods. I stop at my favorite spot. It is on the edge of the gorgeous cool river. There are rocks to move all along the bank. I arrange them. And I see how the flow of the water changes. The water is always smooth and slow. I smell the trees. They smell like heat. I hear the chirping birds, and I wonder what they are saying. So the next one is wishing, and it's a picture of a hog. Okay, this is really hard. <laughs> Mahoney River. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I was I was riding. She was paddling. I knew long ago many black people were slaves. She rem she remembered that many of her ancestors were slaves. I knew I wanted a different world. She wanted a different world. I wish that it had never happened. She wished it had never happened. I wish the river could wash it away. She wished everyone could paddle down the river peacefully and be free. I wish, I wish we could all be free too. And as she sat on the bank, she wished her ancestors could be with her. So the next one and very last one, flower bed. It's a picture of flowers, I think daisies. I see a flower bed growing in the sunlight. 
The flowers are like people. Is it because they both are beautiful? Is it because they both are around the world? Is it because they both smell welcoming? Or is it, is it because they both reproduce? Or is it because they both grow? Flowers seem to be asking the same question. Thank you. I don't have to follow, but Sherry will do it perfectly. Sherry Dolapena is a lifelong tree hugger, bird watcher, and earth lover. Her training as a children's librarian helps her communicate her love of nature to children. She lives in Canfield with her husband, two indoor cats, countless chipmunks, and squirrels, and a rainbow of birds. Please welcome Sherry Delapena. My poem was short, but I want to give you a little bit of background. I came to visit the show with a friend of mine uh, when it first opened, and I walked around, and many of the pieces spoke to me, and I wrote the things down that they said, and went home, and there was really only one that really spoke loudly enough for me to translate. And this is Ode on a Constellation of Joys, with nods to John Keats and H.G. Wells. <laughs> what time machine is this? How is it made of lacy gears? How can it mesh, wind, spin time back and back? Memory is serenity, enfolded within grandma's arms, contentment. Supple fingers laced into mine, firm hook loops, supple threads, time into time into time. Lacy wheels spin rounder, wider, while perforated edges link, catch, snatch wrists of luxury of bygone time. Tangle today those cozy, cozy threads knotted, now and forever, move forward, forward, as I travel and fold it in memory. I say thank you to Catherine and Fonte. I hope you're here, but if you're not, I thank you anyway for your beautiful rendition of Holes in My Soul. It's the black uh, doily hanging that's on the left-hand side as you're looking at it. My grandmother told me she'd teach me how to crochet doilies and she was very good at it and I was not. Um, I did know how to crochet and I bought the crochet cotton and I bought the crochet hook that she told me and she got sick. I was older, my kids had already been born and the time kind of melted into each other. And so it never happened that she taught me how to crochet those doilies. But when I see them, wherever they are at an antique shop or those flea markets that I used to go to before public and um, even in my own home, I still have some of hers. And I looked at that crochet cotton ball that was stuck somehow, why I don't know, in the piano bench, tucked between the hand and finger exercises that I did master fairly well and the Chopin fragrance that I never did master at all. And finally, I decided I was not going to go on Google or YouTube or anywhere else to learn that myself and decided to pass that thread and hook along to someone who might use them. And now my piano bench has a little more room in it and I have a little more memory to keep with me. Thank you so much. Julie Cantillo Harper's Unexpected Pandemic Sabbatical opened her heart to all the things she had meant to try but never made time for. Today she practices Reiki, 
rigid heavy leaving and tarot for self-care in addition to writing poetry, nonfiction, and the occasional screenplay. Curiosity is her gold star. Please welcome Julie Cancio Harper. Thank you to the wonderful Karen Shearer. I am here in no small part because Lake Youngstown has saved my life. I was deeply inspired by this art show. There are two pieces that I wrote about. One of them is a poem, and I'm going to start there. The other was an essay I did not want to write, and it didn't give me a choice. So, um, in the second bay, on the inside, there's a photograph called Just an Illusion by Diane Beatty. And it depicts what looks to me like a grungy basement sink with an astonishingly bright dark sky. So, clown sink. You get used to it, the gray. You adapt or maybe overlook is the word. But the point is, it isn't new, so you don't record it. You feel the temperature of water, too hot if you've been running white with the washing machine, or too frigid in winter when the pipes leach heat into the unfinished basement. It's all right. After a few years, you don't even notice the clown. That may seem strange, but the alive thing about your moments at the sink is the procession of alternating soaps. French milled lavender, then a medicinal pump soap, then a bar of citrus olive oil that makes bubbles so small and dense they feel like whipping cream. You notice the texture of the cheap, rough cotton towel that matches nothing. And your hair, wild in the mirror, silvering with worry, with wisdom, with the spinning of the tilted world of time. snack table. There is a rather large acrylic by Kate Correct the store. And it's called Blood Moon. And when I previewed the art show online, I couldn't really tell where the focal point was supposed to be. So I dragged myself over here. Like I gotta get there as soon as I can because I feel like there's something in it. There's something important. And I'm standing there. Oh uh oh. And so uh, I went home Friday, and uh, a third of this fell out. And then Saturday, I rested and thought, no, I can't finish that up. And then Sunday, I went to an awesome Fourth of July party, and my cousin talked me into finishing on Monday. So here it is. Inspired by Blood Moon. <laughs> Blood Moon. In 2014, there are two Blood Moons. The first is in April, and the second is in October. The day before the second, I'm a 38-year-old freelance producer, and I am in a truck stop bathroom stall. I'm covered in gore. Stopping pad, drenched cotton panties, and jeans bloomed through with stains halfway down each thigh. I've been stuck on a bridge in traffic for two hours after spending all day driving a television crew around the various shooting locations in Detroit. My head hurts. It's been more than six hours since I ate lunch and none of it was chocolate. <laughs> my last bathroom break was right before lunch. There's a gnawing in my pelvis that says I'm late for Advil. And I'm in a hurry because the executive producer and the director of photography are in the men's room 
and I know they'll both be out fast. We're still more than three hours from home base. Dinner is whatever I can grab from the in-house satellite Taco Bell. My heart pounds thickly in my chest and TikTok goes along. I unzip my backpack and balance a clean pair of jeans, brush underwear, knee pad gingerly on top of the toilet paper dispenser. I grab my tennis shoes to make it easier to remove the first pair of jeans, sliding each pant leg carefully to the ankle and over the heel as I tilt forward, perched and gripping over the toilet bowl. I fold the jeans sides together and then roll them compact and push them to the bottom of my go bag. The underwear and pads come off as one saturated sticky unit. I bundle them with the cleanest fabric facing out and stuff a full wad into the wax paper bag inside the metal trash bin. Six months ago, the day after the April blood moon, when I was hospitalized for acute bronchitis, I learned three things. One, it frightens emergency room personnel when your oxygen saturation is in the 70s and your hemoglobin is in the 70s. Two, a hospital admission speeds up the processing of your Medicaid application. And three, I am anemic. When I'm asked who my primary care doctor is, I must admit that I don't have one. I receive a breathing treatment and fluids and steroids and a blood transfusion and two drip bags of liquid iron. I cough out alarming quantities of phlegm. At first, it's so watery that it feels like reverse drowning. Later, it's so thick, I can catch it with my fingers and pull it forward through my throat in strands like reverse gummy worms. After two nights, I am relieved with prescriptions for more steroids, an inhaler, and iron tablets. My husband and I walk into Rite Aid a bit dazed and unsure if the Medicaid number I've been given is even real. We drop off, drop off prescriptions at the pharmacy. The number seems to do the trick. And we stand in the aisle between greeting cards and fruity soaps, waiting for the scripts to be filled. When we look at each other, we burst into tears and then hug for a long time. Back at the truck stop, it takes a few rounds of swiping with bits of meager, translucent tissue before I brace myself and pull the string. Bloop! The tampon bobs. Gravity surges forward with a warm gush. And confronted with a dominant right hand, flick from wrist to oozing fingertips with my own red black blood. The iron tablets are working, and as a reward for getting my hemoglobin back to normal, my periods are heavier than ever. I'm horrified at a Stephen King's carry of the prom type level. I freeze for a moment to consider my options. I need my hand back so I can get dressed, clean up the crime scene I've made of the seat and floor and get back to business. On the other side of the stall door and maybe eight feet away is a bank of bathroom sinks. Too far to be helpful right now. I'm naked from the waist down except for socks. I do not have the patience to gather up enough toilet tissue with my left hand to dab at my right. I need something fast that won't make more mess. I have a few ounces left in my water bottle, maybe enough to wet a wad of toilet paper to wipe the seat and floor. Can I rinse my hands? If I pour water over my hand, where will the runoff go? Into the toilet? None of this seems feasible. And my heartbeat becomes audible to me. Chunk, chunk, chunk. Then a sudden thought arrow is shunted into my brain. I'm struck by an image of my right hand plunging into the toilet water. No, chunk. No, 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 ka-chunk. I think this is not a thing I would do, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. I replay my options, ka-chunk. I pause for a long, sweet breath. No new intel arrives. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka Three heartbeats later, I know it's my best option. My 
feel a brief angelic wave of resolve pass from my scalp through to my feet and then glide smoothly away into the ground. Then I plunge my right hand into a truck stop public commode and get on with my work day. I'm in line at Taco Bell, fully scrubbed up and skimming the menu when Jay the exec finds me. I don't see him walk up, but I turn as I hear his voice. Hey, we gotta go. I'm not clear on his meaning, so I stand still looking at him as he turns to walk away. He notices I'm not following, so his tone is more insistent when he says, we'll get you dinner later. We have a medical emergency in the van. We hustle out the door and he calls back over his shoulder. I'll drive, find me the nearest urgent care. I get the passenger seat and glance into the second row as I click my seatbelt. Loco, the DP, is putting pressure on his right back. I Google keywords, urgent care nearby, as I ask, what happened? Loco says he was disassembling a camera cage when his multi-tool knife, when he slipped and stabbed himself in the leg. I can see that his jeans are sliced through, but there's no visible blood yet. I find an urgent care one mile from our current position. I confirm that it's open and we head there at the top speed. Loco offers me the last burrito from his order because he feels bad that he's making me even later for dinner. I tell him to stop worrying and keep pressure on that leg. I call the production coordinator to report the workplace injury and I ask him to contact the production manager and fax workers comp paperwork to the urgent care. We arrive there in about four minutes. The workers comp paperwork is there. Loco is ushered directly to a treatment room and ends up with about five stitches. It takes a while, so I have plenty of time to go one mile down the road, pick up some White Castle sliders and fries. I eat in the van, watching over the film equipment while the exec paces the parking lot making phone calls. I collect Loco from the waiting room and pick up the paperwork and antibiotic prescription that is waiting at the counter. As we pile back in the van, Jay tells me I've done enough for one day and he'll drive us back to base camp. I don't argue. We've been on the clock for 13 hours. Jay turns to Loco and jokes, you scared me back there. I thought you were gonna bleed out. They're both laughing now, relaxing as we pull onto the highway. Loco says, have you going for a minute there? I was tense, but I'm good. It's all good. I gaze out the window, silent, set apart from their macho rubbery. Jay says, hey, do you guys like history? Yeah, we do. So we played the first episode of Hardcore History, Wrath of the Con. Somewhere in the middle, I notice that Loco has dozed off in the back seat, cuddled under his jacket. Jay sees me looking and says, see out? Oh yeah, I say. He's down to the count. We turn down the podcast volume and speak in soft voices the rest of the way back, like a family of warriors returning home exhausted from battle. It will be two more years until my first pelvic exam at age 40 reveals a fibroid the size of a grapefruit. Three months later, I will be recovering from a total hysterectomy. Without my uterus, I'm no longer anemic. I have not sought out a producing job since my surgery. It will take me five years to begin to understand that personal power comes from balance and self-care. I'm still realizing all the ways I pushed too hard back then. I'm still looking for work where I can feel the purpose I felt on set. Well done. Kelly Kirksey is a global traveler, speaker, poet, tree hugger, yoga teacher, holistic psychotherapist, family lover, drummer, dancer, spa promoter, heart-centered hypnotherapist, live happily life consultant, and has presented workshops and wellness roles both nationally and internationally. Please welcome Kelly Kirksey.
First, I want to say thank you for the invitation to share, to be here among people, mostly without masks, some with masks, some young and fresh, and some just with so much wisdom in the palms of their hands. So I'm so grateful to be here. I also find myself feeling a little emotional. And I, I want to say that some of the words that I'm going to share probably are not suitable for a young audience. It's not pretty. And it's not sweet. So there is a beautiful photograph over there, and it's called Birds of a Feather. So those feathers uh, spoke to me a bit. So I wrote a little something called The Opposite of My Constitution. Light as a parade of feathers, I long to be. So during, during COVID, I did so much writing, and most of that writing was really spurred from what I call ancestral memories. And with the events of the summer of 2020 and the murder of George Floyd, so many emotions flooded me again and again and again, and I can't swim. Like, I literally don't know how to swim, yet I was caught in wave after wave and found myself going under so many times. And it was really pen and paper that saved me and kept me, kept me afloat. All right, so here is a little poem I wrote on July 29, 2020, at 9.57 a.m. And it's called Eating Scraps and Slave Consciousness. Sick, tired, worn out, frustrated, hopeless, disconnected remnants of slave consciousness. Never enough, anxious, not good, judged, odd, awkward. Eating the scraps. Can't fit, won't fit, silence, can't stop, medicine ripped away, drum ripped away, culture ripped away, language ripped away. Children ripped away. Mother Africa ripped away. Grieving, tired to the bone, running to freedom, unsafe, unheard. Unseen soul ties. So where to now? So where to now? So where to now? This next one is called She Wondered. And as I mentioned before, you might want to send your kids out. Because I do believe, and I say that with sincerity and honesty, because I do believe that young children get to be young children and they don't have to digest a lot of what is in the value, a lot of what that exists in the air of our society, of our world. So I ask you to take a breath with me. Take an inhale. Exhale. As a way to create more space to be present. You might even want to tap your foot. Let's just tap the foot for a minute. So tapping the foot in an effort to be in your body present. 
as opposed to in your grocery list. This is called She Wondered. And she wondered why she dared not touch upon or listen to the whispers of those deep groaning emotions that she strangled deep inside. Don't pay them no mind. Keep picking cotton. Feel and be killed. Don't pay your heart no mind. Keep feeding master's babies while your own children starve to death. Don't pay your sorrow no mind. Keep looking at the ceiling while your body is being violated. Don't pay your terror no mind. Keep toiling in the hot sun as your throat seizes up from thirst. Don't pay your needs no mind as your stomach swells from the malnourishment. Don't pay your longings no mind as you cry deep into the night. And she wondered why she dared not touch upon or listen to the whispers of those deep groaning emotions that she buried deep into her bones. I have two more pieces I'd like to share. And this piece is called To Be Well. It's a bit of prose. I know that it takes immense effort to get up and put the body in motion. It takes enormous energy to throw your legs off the side of the bed and to take those first uncomfortable, painful steps. There are days when seeing the rising sun is a point of grief. Another day of this deeply sad and difficult life. May night come fast so I can disconnect from cold reality. I know that taking a pause to check out your emotional landscape is not encouraged in our society. Keep grinding. That's the gold standard. Stay on your hustle. Well, staying on your hustle is what we did when the cotton was hot. At this point in our history, in order to save our own lives, we must invite ourselves to sit in the glider on the porch and drink cold iced tea. I know that self-care is essentially an act of rebellion. How dare I stop working from sun up to sundown and honor this body that houses my soul? How dare I? Self-loathing is not an act of social justice. When I nurture myself in a holistic manner, I invite balanced energy into my mind, my body, my spirit. With renewed energy, I am more able to invest in the necessary practices to create systemic change. Without renewed energy, it is impossible to effectively combat and dismantle systemic racism. I know that trauma and pain is held in the muscles, held in the bones, it's held in the cells of our body. I know that while physical pain is real, emotional pain is physical. I know that our body holds the stories of our past. We hold our fear, anger, grief, and sorrow in the pit of our stomachs, in the temple of our heads, in the tension of our backs, and the tightness of our jaw. The body holds on to stories and the stories take a toll on our physical temple. We must engage, we must refresh the body. 
by moving the inner story outside of us. Dancing, drumming, running, yoga, all of these things, we must move those stories out of our body. We must have a physical practice that helps us to ungrip those old stories that we don't even realize are shaking us. I have one more. Take a breath. Let it out. <sighs> yeah. It, it, uh, I find that it takes a bit of courage to be a witness to someone's pain and discomfort, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, that it takes courage. So we all are courageous because we've witnessed so much pain and discomfort in this past year. There is a, a, a wonderful... Uh, tapestry uh, right around the corner, and it's by Joyce Morrow Jones. She's an artist, a textile artist in Cleveland, Ohio, and her piece is entitled My Black is Beautiful. Let's clap for that. <laughs> and to be honest, when I came in and I was perusing, and I saw that piece and stopped. And I didn't want to be a cliche. I didn't want to be the black girl that's going to write about the black peas, the black lady. Well, here I am, the black girl that wrote about the black peas that haunted me, that came home with me, that followed me, that haunted me in the best of ways, that gave me hope from the stories that I share. So this is called Oh Mata. Miss America, Miss World, Miss Universe, Black Madonna, Mother of All. Deep in the night, I have wept tears of longing for your guidance, your strength, your grace. In reality, you're never far. Always protecting and encouraging greatness. I see you, Queen, dropping prayer feathers as you glide through life, exhaling blessings, red robes flowing as your calorie shells tell the past and future of your descendants. Oh, my Queen, with your fragrant crown of flowers soothing my troubled heart. The words you speak from your ruby red lips Give me life and soothe my spirit. Sacred geometry lighting your path. Wiry hair like antennas reaching towards the sun. Ancestors whispering healing potions in your ear. The entire universe held in your gaze. The entire universe under your protective mantle. The entire universe guided towards benevolent, peaceful transformation. Finally, giving birth to equality and justice. Long over. Cassandra Love, Lit Youngstown's Outreach Coordinator, is a student in the Northeast Ohio Master of Fine Arts. She received her Bachelor's in Human Development and Family Studies and her Master's in Social, er, I'm sorry, her Bachelor's, did I say that right? Yep, yeah. And her Master's in Social Work from Michigan State University. 
And she even finishes my sentence, <laughs> which is so helpful. Her career goal is to bring creative writing and its healing effects into therapeutic and community spaces. Please welcome Cassandra Lott. Um, so a big thanks to all of you who are here, um, to the YWCA for having us, um, and to Liz Cooper, who is our piece titled Handed Down, which inspired this first piece, which is not mentioned, um, flash piece. It's way in the back over there, um, and there's a beautiful photograph. Um, so this piece is called Passed Down. There are things in which families purposely pass down. Grandma's cookie recipe, a famous seasoning mix for meat, or perhaps cabbage rolling. Thin shaking fingers move to a rhythm long practiced as veiny hands caress the vegetables like a newborn baby. The leaves blanch, the innards intact, it is a ritual to be performed. One that a much younger woman practices beside the master. It is in these moments of teaching that we bond, we relate, and we pass on. One could argue it is impossible to share all of a person's knowledge, and therefore we choose the most important things to pass on to others. You have to be careful. My grandmother's voice was timid, more of a whisper than a full tone. If you pull too hard, you could rip the small plant from the ground or mush the berry, and we don't want either of those. I nodded, a child of only eight at the time. I was cautious and careful, worried of harming the things around me, including the small Michigan strawberry in my palm. I copied as she did, pulling the berry from the stem piece by piece until it came free, and I was able to place it in a small pink basket around my wrist. She reached out to pick another, and I admired her skin wrinkling around the hummingbird tattoo that adorned her wrist. She had tattoos dotting her body, and I wonder now what each one symbolized to her. Golden bracelets jingled on her wrist as her fingers embraced the juicy berry, carefully plucking it from its home and into her own blue basket. These berries were ones that she planted in the flower bed beside her home and we watered together ever since. They were a plant we could depend on, to produce decadent fruit to top our salads or to embellish our desserts. But once the berries grew, she instilled in me how important the picking process was. And that's that, that's on. Um, so this next one is a um, flash fiction piece that will be um, featured in Bridge of Lovington Review in September's issue, um, and it is titled Once More We Dance. My fingers drift over the disc as I put the CD to rest in the device. I need not look at the buttons, the process is all too familiar. My gaze lifts toward my husband, Bruce's tan hand extends toward me. The calluses from days of hard work glisten in the sunlight from the nearby window. He is in his special tuxedo with white, firm shoulders and red accents. Compared to him, I am terribly underdressed in a thin red slip, but Bruce doesn't mind and neither do I. My hand slides into, onto his left shoulder blade and our hips adjourn just as the violins begin their crescendo. His arm slips around my back and we lock hands, his cold hands in my warm one. Bruce takes the first step and I follow as we toast in harmony. The piano commences in the background as I perform the first twist of the dance. His arms embrace me, reassuring me that everything is okay. His sturdy chest presses against my back, providing me the confidence to keep moving forward. I close my eyes, recalling that it was 30 years ago when this very song cascaded through the white and red room. From my gorgeous white gown with maroon train to each of the hundred, hundred water tablets Bruce and I painted this world, the room was perfect that day. But the room didn't win my heart. 
nor did the eyes of those watching me as I stepped onto the dance floor. It was through standing in front of me in the same touch that melted away my fears. My heart was sold from the moment our hands bit seamlessly into one another and he swept me off my feet with such vigor, I forgot everyone was watching. To this day, I put my trust in Bruce to glide me through the air without issue. I don't worry about knocking into anything, in part because the room is empty save for a framed photo of our wedding and the CD player. I worry only about staying in the moment with him. Today, two deep dimples tug playfully at the edges of his lips. He's happy. Carla, I can't keep pretending. My vision blurs the words of our family members rushing through my mind. I stumble over the beat. You need to move on. I won't move on. The flutes join in my personal favorite, and I step back into the rhythm. Bruce doesn't miss a beat as we float into the kitchen, onto the dark and dense in the wood where the stove and marble tower island once rested. Each instrument is chiming in now, pulling me to the left for a twirl and to the right for a foot change. I pivot and Bruce follows in train. There's nothing more to sell. You can't stay here. This is our home. I won't leave him. We avoid, we avoid the bedroom. I can't let Bruce see our bed is gone. Instead, we curve sharply back into the living room as the piano coffins. I take a quick glance to ensure the wedding picture has the same Bruce, Bruce that is in front of me. He wouldn't have wanted you to live like this. The flutes come to a stop, leaving the lone piano note. Bruce's brown eyes peer into mine. They're the same eyes that prove to me time and time again that I am safe because he is here next to me. As he comes to a slow stop, his eyes soften before breaking my gaze. He releases his embrace and takes a few steps back. Like pouring rain clouding the view of a mountain, one by one his features become unclear. I struggle to make out his freckles as they fade in and out of my vision. His dimples disappear, followed by his pale lips. Little by little, my husband vanishes before me and is replaced with the green walls of our empty living room. I rush forward toward the blur that remains of Bruce as the clarinets chime, signaling the next long beginning. His calloused hand extends out, offering me relief from the pain. I place my hand where his should be, his features returning as I imagine his arms around me. Once more, we dance. Thank you all so much for being such an attentive audience and congratulations to our, the artists of this fine work and thank you again to tonight's readers.